So this morning, we're going to continue in our series, and I'm going to move rather quickly here. Luke chapter 8, Jesus the miracle worker. We've been going through different miracles, and uh, today we're talking about the healing of the woman with the issue of blood. And as we do that, you're going to realize that this miracle, like several of the others that we've talked about, takes place in Capernaum. Uh, we talked about that, reminded some of you that have been to Israel with us uh, where we walked, and, and you've seen this place. So we're just going to jump right in. Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 40, it says this, So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. Well, they welcomed him. They were, they were excited to have him back. And we see that, that when Jesus showed up in a place, people knew something was going to happen. When he went over across to Gadara, you remember as soon as he got out of the boat, man, there was the multitude. When he gets to this area, immediately, here they are, immediately in this story, uh, they welcome him. They're glad he's there. Well, when we continue on in the story, you find that there's a man named Jairus that comes and meets him in this crowd that welcomes him is this man. So jump down to verse 41. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he, that's Jesus, went, the multitudes thronged him. Well, this guy, you can imagine this dad, he's concerned. He makes his way up to the front. He pushes through. He gets there, and he's a pretty well-established guy. He's a ruler of the synagogue, probably well-known in the community. And he says, my daughter's dying. I need you to come. And you can imagine what he wants. What he wants is for Jesus immediately to push the crowd out of the way and to make a beeline for his house. When we're sick, we want healing right away. When it's a loved one, we want healing right away. But that's not what happened. What we find in the story is the multitude, the word here is they thronged him or inundated or crammed in or pressed in upon him to where he can't move. I mean, the best thing I can think about this is like, you know, this is Black Friday coming up this week, right? Those of you that are going to go wait in line for hours and take your chairs and have your strategies all set, you know what it is that when the store doors open or they start to see one of the workers making their way over toward the door, what does everybody do? They start pushing in. And you read about it in the news, people that are getting trampled as they're going in to buy stuff on Black Friday. And so uh, I can just picture it was worse than that. That here it is when it says the multitudes thronged him, that Jesus, he, he doesn't have space like we have space here. They're pressing in up on him close, and he's trying to, he's trying to talk to everyone around him. So get that picture. It's, it's huge. So here's Jairus, leader of the synagogue, an urgent need, wants Jesus to meet it right away. But everybody in the multitude felt like their need was an urgent need. They all wanted something from Jesus. Isn't it interesting? Whatever your need is, you always feel like it's the most important. I mean, a guy's daughter could be dying, but if you're not feeling well, that need's big. And, and here it is with Jesus. They're just going, hey, on your way over there, can you just touch me too? Can you do this? Can you do this? And they're all asking something. I get tickled every once in a while, and you guys, you'll sense it as well. But people will come up and go, Pastor, but, but can you just make this one exception, an exception just for me? Can you make this happen just for me? And it's like, sure, there's several hundred other other exceptions that are going to be wanted as well get this picture in your mind of what's happening because one person has a daughter that's dying and wants jesus to move through there as quickly as possible and everybody else gets in the way they all stop him because their needs are so important but here's something that that's going to be interesting to you you've probably read this story so many times and you knew the name of jairus you knew what was happening with his daughter but have you ever noticed that jesus didn't get in a hurry his daughter's dying. We want Jesus to act right away, but Jesus didn't get in a hurry. He just kind of pauses, actually. Look here, verse 43. Now, a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. So here's Jesus. He's not in a big hurry. These other people are coming over. This lady who's been sick for 12 years, by the way, you know that 12 is one of those important numbers. You see there's got to be something significant. Luke 8, the 12 disciples, right? They're traveling with Jesus. Then you see here in verse 42 that Jairus' daughter was 12 years old. This woman had an issue of blood for 12 years. You say, so what's the significance? I don't know, but there's got to be something. We see all these 12s popping up. 
But what do we know about this woman? Because that's the primary focus today. She's not named. We sometimes worry so much about our name and being known. And every, This lady was not even named. That wasn't important to Jesus. He knew the individual. She didn't care if everybody knew her name. But look how other people knew her. And this is the sad part of this. They knew her by her condition. They didn't say, oh, that's, that's Sue or, or that's Julie or that's... They didn't say that. They said, oh, that's that woman with that, that uh, issue. That woman with that issue. You know some people like that. And sometimes in the church, we're the worst at saying, oh, yeah, that's that drug addict. Oh, yeah, that's that drunk. Oh, yeah, that's that person that did whatever. And we're, we have to be so careful that we, as followers of Jesus Christ, don't begin to label people by their failures, that we see them the way Jesus sees them. And this unnamed woman, known by her condition, in this huge crowd, Jesus made time. The leader of the synagogue's daughter's dying, and Jesus is making time for this unnamed lady. Boy, don't miss that. So she has this issue of blood. Best that we would understand it, it would be a continuous uh, menstrual cycle for about 12 years. And the Greek language actually implies it this way, that she's gushing or a, a fountain. It's a hemorrhaging. So she's probably very frustrated, anemic, very weak. Uh, been to doctors. It tells us here that, that she has spent everything that she had. She gets no healing. Mark chapter 5 actually tells us that her condition had gotten worse in spite of going for the medical help. She spent all her money and she has no relief. So here, here's basically where it comes back. She's exhausted every physical human resource over 12 years trying to get help and nothing has helped. Nothing. Every day, this lady's life was a struggle. That insult to injury, if you know anything about the Jewish culture, you understand she was ceremonial uncle ceremonially unclean. So not only is she not feeling well, she's probably very frustrated, probably in a, in a terrible mood. She's probably, as, as I mentioned, very weak. And now everybody's looking at her, known by her condition, and saying, oh, don't get around her. Anything that she touched was considered unclean. If you were to go back to Leviticus chapter 15, I'm only going to read a small portion, but the chapter I encourage you to go back later and delve into it a little bit deeper. It describes what it means if a woman is in this condition and how she is unclean and then anything she comes in contact with is unclean. But listen to just uh, a brief section here, uh, starting in verse 19. If a woman has a discharge and the discharge from her body is blood, she should be set apart seven days. Listen to this. And whoever touches her shall be unclean until evening. Now, it goes on about this explanation of the ceremonial uncleanness uh, as you go through the rest of the chapter, but here's some of the stuff it says. Uh, she couldn't sit on the same chair as anyone else. She couldn't sleep in the same bed as anyone else. She couldn't sit at the same table as anyone else. She couldn't touch anyone, husband, children, anyone in public, people that she loved. The multitude by law, with this lady being out there and amongst them intentionally, and touching them, she had violated the law and technically could be stoned to death. That's how seriously they took this. And so here's this lady, and I think this is so important uh, to understand, but this lady that had been really limited in every aspect of her life. I mean, we, we, the best thing that we could probably compare this to would, would be, you know, a couple of years ago with the COVID lockdowns, and we didn't experience it here in Florida like they did in some states or in some countries. I don't know if you remember reading, but there were some that if they contacted uh, COVID in some of the countries that were literally putting them in their homes and sealing them in their homes. They were locked in from the outside. And when you think about that, that's this lady. She can't touch anything. She can't hug anyone. She can't come up and embrace anyone. She can't sit by anyone. She can't chair, share a chair. She can't share a table. She can't do any of that based on the ceremonial law, the Jewish law here. It's awful. So now after trying everything in the world that she had, she turns to Jesus. Twelve years of trying it on her own. Twelve years of trying to fix everything on her own. Sound familiar? 
And we're prone to that, aren't we? We try to fix everything on our own. We wait until, we, uh, we, you'll hear it every once in a while, and I've been a pastor for a long time, and you get those phone calls, hey, I'm being evicted from my house today. I need help by 3 o'clock. And you're going, that's not how this works. You've had months and months and months to go through this process. Why did you wait until today? Because we're prone as human beings to go through and try everything we can on our own. Men, you're wired to try to be the problem solver, the fixer, to get it all right. And in this case, she had tried it all on her own. All the worldly cures. Sound familiar? Why do people turn to drugs? Why do people become uh, addicted to alcohol? Why do people turn to sex? Why do people turn to travel? Why do people turn to buying and purchasing all the toys? It, we all go about it different ways. For some, it's to withdraw into a bottle, and for some, it's to spend everything on fun. But the ultimate is, ultimately, when we're missing something in our lives and we're trying to fix it, we all have a different means by which we try to get our fix. And Jesus says, just bring it to me. Ecclesiastes, Solomon supposedly one of the wisest men in the Bible, but with all the concubines, you just have to go, wow, seriously? But we know he was. He was one of the wisest men who ever lived, and he said this, the foolishness of the world, and he goes down the list. I won't read all of it, but summarizing it. Why, I've tried wine, building homes, planting vineyards, gardens, groves, friends, flocks, herds, money, music, concubines and sexual pleasure but it was all vanity he said i've tried it all i've tried it all and it's all vanity he says all the things the world had to offer fall short now that's coming from the wisest man in the world everything the world has to offer falls short he's really saying this only jesus can satisfy your soul there was an old song by by that same time only jesus can satisfy your soul. We're going to keep trying things because we as human beings just don't want to listen to those that have gone before and we want to th think that we're an exception and we just keep saying, but not me, or I can fix this, or this will work out. Listen, only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Nothing else. You can keep trying it, but it's going to fall short. So let's go back to the woman. So now she's tried everything else. She comes to Jesus. She is fully believing. We have no indication whatsoever that this was a, I'm going to try Jesus. She was fully committed. She'd done everything else humanly possible. She said, I got nowhere else to go, and everything is possible with God. So here she goes. She is coming in full force. She has suffered physically, emotionally, financially. She's got nothing to lose. And so she knows Jesus is in the crowd. She's not supposed to be out in public. If she bumps into anyone, remember, could mean the end of her life. The Greek word, though, tells it this way. It's, it's the word haptomai. And it means not that she touched the garment. You ever, you ever th watch a little kid, and they're walking over by an electrical outlet or the stove, and you're going, don't touch that. Don't touch that. And they just look at you. And then if they're, they're one of those kids, they go. You get this idea when we read the story that the woman touched his garment. That is not what that Greek word says. That Greek word tells it this way. She seized it. She grabbed it to the point of almost pulling it off. I mean, grabbed it and held on so hard. We read the story so quickly and not taking it all into account. This woman had this issue she had nowhere else to go she had exhausted every resource and when she grabbed hold of jesus garment she was not letting go she seized it she was desperate desperate people don't walk by and go man they grab on to jesus and that's what she did and it says here that immediately again the greek word ethus it means immediately, immediately, without any delay, the issue that had plagued her for 12 years stopped. It ceased immediately. It didn't like kind of trickle off and, well, we'll see what happens. No, immediately. And we've seen that with every one of these miracles. Jesus doesn't heal part way. 
He doesn't heal the mute guy and all of a sudden he walks away with a lisp. He doesn't heal the guy's eyes, the blind man, and he walks away, you know, with 2200 vision. He doesn't heal the guy that's lame and he walks away with a limp. When Jesus touches you, you are healed completely. When we catch this idea, it changes the way that we respond. When we're touched by Jesus, when you really experience salvation, you are changed. It's no longer, well, I'm going to try Jesus. This lady wasn't trying. She knew it, that was her last hope. She seized him, and it changed her. Look at verse 45. And Jesus said, who touched me? You have to get this picture. It's almost like, man, this lady's hanging down there. Who touched me? It also raises some questions we'll ask in just a moment. But when all denied it, looked around, all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, come on, the multitude's throng, and they press you, and you say, who touched me? Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. Interesting question, isn't it? Who touched me? He's God, right? He knew who touched him, or did he? I mean, again, get the picture, Black Friday idea. This is the, those of you that go to concerts, here you are. It's the, you're, you're going in the doors of the concert. You're going in at a, a football game into the stadium, and the door opens, and now all of a sudden, man, you're pushing in. You want to get in there first. Remember, you have an assigned seat in most cases, right? But everybody's pushing, and they're, they're pushing, and you're grabbing, you're holding on to your purse, you're holding on to your wallet, and one of the things that made me think of was we had the opportunity, my wife and I, in 1999 to go over to Paris. And we're going up on the, um, the, the elevator in the Eiffel Tower, and a friend of ours that was with us thought, this is nuts. We're, we're inside of there, and we're, we're just like this. And so he put his arm up to take a picture because it was just so crowded. He thought, let me just get a picture of this. He rode the rest of the way like this because he couldn't get his arm down. That's a true story. It was that tight. So you're in that elevator, and all of a sudden he said, who touched me? <laughs> That's Jesus, that kind of a crowd. And you almost have to just laugh with Peter's question. Master, the multitude's throng and pressure. And you ask the question, who touched me? Come on. Come on. But Jesus knew. And it really does make you ask the question just, just for a minute. You go, did he know or did he not know? Well, there's a term here. And it's called kenosis, K-E-N-O-S-I-S. -S. And there are different ideas in theology about if, whether or not Jesus had uh, full kenosis, partial kenosis. What does that mean? It means a cloaking of his attributes, his divine attributes. The idea there and what we would believe is, is a partial kenosis to where, sure, he, he knew, but he didn't actually use in some cases. This idea that he was omnipotent, all-powerful, but he allowed himself to be taken captive. He allowed himself to be nailed to the cross. Even though he was omnipotent, he allowed that to happen. He was omniscient. He knew everything. He knew what the Pharisees were thinking. Remember that? But in, in this case, being omniscient, he asked this question, who touched me? So we would say, did, did he really know? And Mark answers that for us. In Mark's gospel, in the same story, he was looking for the woman who touched him. Jesus knew exactly who it was. He knew it was a woman, but he's asking the question. So then you have to say, well, if he knew, why did he ask the question? Very interesting. Luke verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 47, look at this. So now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came out trembling. When he asked the question, it wasn't because he didn't know. When he asked the question, it was because he was calling her out. Who touched me? Where is the woman that touched me? Based on what Mark said, she knew. I can't hide. He's got me. Caught. Guilty. When you continue reading in verse 47, it says, She came trembling and falling down before him. She declared him in the presence of all the people the reason that she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. So verse 47, she knows, I can't remain anonymous any longer. I've been caught. I've been called out. It said she came trembling. Why? Was she embarrassed? Maybe her medical condition was going to be exposed and she didn't want to have to talk about that and everybody knew it and it's like, oh, I, I just don't want to have to face that. Or was she afraid? Was she afraid that he was calling her out? Because remember, 
she could be killed for this. She was spreading a disease in public, in their minds, spreading a disease that would make them ceremonially unclean, and she knew this could cost me my life. I don't know exactly why she came trembling, but Jesus, I think, calls her out to share her story. And I think we can read that very, very clearly here. She felt the power of God. He felt that power go out. She felt the power to cleanse her and to heal her. Nobody else could share her story like she could share her story. Nobody. Nobody else could say, hey, let me tell you about this story of this lady that came in that was sick for 12 years and she got healed. No, 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 you're telling somebody else's story and you don't understand it the way they understand it. You didn't spend the money she spent. You didn't try all the doctors that she tried. You didn't feel the pain that she felt. You didn't feel the weakness that she encountered. You didn't feel all that. But when that lady begins to tell her story, here's how people made me feel. Here's what I felt on a daily basis. I could barely get out of bed. I, I, I couldn't touch anything. I couldn't hug my kids. I couldn't spend time with my husband. I couldn't sit at the table with my family. I couldn't go out in public and she tells that story she said but jesus healed me he healed me she shares it with a passion that a third party can't share she tells a story in the way that nobody else can tell it you say so pastor why do you think that's so important because i think it ties in with the command that we have that we're supposed to go share our story nobody nobody can tell your salvation story like you can tell your story. Nobody can tell your, your story like, like you can tell your story. I hear people say, okay, well, I, I just gave my life to Jesus, but I don't know how to tell people about that. Just tell them what happened. Nobody can tell it like you can tell it. Yeah, but I, but I probably need to go learn the Romans road first so I can really share my story. No, no. You say, but I need to learn uh, through the book of Acts how to, how to share the gospel. No, but I need to learn EE, or I need to learn faith evangelism, or I need to learn the word of this book, or I need to learn, just share your story. Just tell your story. Say, but, but you know, my, my friends, listen, you will never have as many lost, unsaved, unchurched friends ever again in your life as you have the day you got saved. They're going to taper off. Some are going to think, wow, I don't know what happened to them. And they're going to separate themselves. You'll never have as many lost friends again as you have on the day you got saved. Share your story. Just tell the story. Just share it. This lady got called out, I really believe, so that she could testify in the middle of the street of what God had done for her. So when you put all this together... You just start to say, wow, is that what we're supposed to do? Yes, that's the miracle in and of itself. Not just the healing, but the power of a story that God gives to every one of us. When we're healed spiritually, when we go from spiritual death to spiritual life, when we are a child of Satan, because the Bible says there's two fathers. You're of your father, the devil, the less of your father you would do. You know, in the spiritual families, that's one father. Or there's God the father. And when we're adopted into the family of God, that we've been given the power to become the children of God, man, you got to tell somebody. You want to tell somebody. You don't want to hide your story. Look what happens next. Verse 48. And he, Jesus, said to her, daughter, don't miss that, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. I just said that all those that receive him to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. Right here he called her daughter. She hadn't been called daughter. After all, all those years, 12 years, she hadn't even been accepted. She hadn't been called daughter. She'd been called outcast. She'd been called dirty. She'd been called unclean. She'd been called you know, oh, probably a whole lot of other things. And right here, Jesus calls her daughter. After not being accepted for so long, man, he heals her soul. Really, he, he heals her soul even more than he heals her physical ailment. Man, don't forget that. That's the miracle here. 
she became a follower of his, a child of his daughter. So how do we apply all this? How do we bring it in today? Number one is this. On your sheet, I think you got these, these blanks. Fill these in. Jesus cared about each individual's problem. For Jairus, he was a desperate dad. You might be a desperate dad in here this morning. Maybe you've got a child that's gone wayward. Maybe one that's sick. Maybe you have other things that you're asking God for, but you're, you're desperate for your kids. Maybe that's you, and God knows your individual need. He knew the need of a bleeding woman. Maybe you've got a health issue. Nobody else understands it like you understand it. Nobody else can tell your story. They didn't go under the knife for you. You went. They're not taking your radiation and chemo for you. You're going through it. They're not dealing with all the things that you're dealing with. You're dealing with it. Nobody else knows like you know. And this story reminds us that God cares about your individual problems. Whatever you're facing today, if it's in your family, if it's in your health, what, whatever it is, maybe it's, it's other things that are going on. Jesus cares. In those same passages, we find that he was healing sick, that he was, he was healing those that were desperate. He was healing those that were demon-possessed. He was healing a myriad of needs. So today, don't think that just because I didn't name your need that he can't meet it. No, the point is that God knows your name. When nobody else did, he did. When everybody else called you an outcast, he can call you a child of his. When everybody else said, oh, get over it, he said, I'll help you through it. I'll walk with you. I'll carry you. So I don't know what your need is this morning, but this story ought to encourage each one of us. The second thing is this. Jesus rewards those who come in faith. Jesus rewards those who come to him in faith. And you may have tried everything there is to try that the world has to offer. Relationships, to drugs, to to trying all to acquire all the, the tools, buying more real estate, traveling more, just doing all the things that come so that you can ease the pain. And the reality is, you need Jesus. Come to him. Stop chasing all the cares and concerns and, and things that the world has to offer and realize that again, only Jesus can satisfy your soul. The third thing is this, God wants to give you peace. I told somebody yesterday, we were down there at Hope South Florida and just going around and praying with people at the, at the tables. And these are people that, you know, one of them, hey, I want to go back to my country. Another one, uh, you know, my wife is sick with cancer. She's in another country. I need, I need to get back there. And somebody else was just saying, hey, we just got here. We don't have a roof over our head or, or any work and pray for this. I mean, the needs just went on and on and on and on. I don't know what your biggest need is, but, but I know that God gives you peace. So for one of the folks, I said, listen, I get asked two major questions right now. I said, one is, are we in the end times? And I told you, my answer is always, we're one day closer today than we were yesterday. That's all I can guarantee you. But the second thing is this, people are asking like never before, how do I know that I have peace with God? How do I know I'm ready? And this story shows us that we just need to come and we need to seize, hang on to, grasp Jesus. Not just walk by and go, you know what, I've tried everything else, I'll try Jesus. I had a guy sit in my office one day and said that. Well, I might as well try Jesus. <laughs> I looked back and said, you don't try Jesus. This isn't like going into a fitting room and see if he fits. And, you know, if not, you just turn it into the counter. No, no, no. When you come in faith, you are seizing hold of Jesus. That You are saying, I want to become a child of yours. So God wants to give you peace, and it's offered to everybody. And if I were to wrap this up with an invitation today, it would be this. I'd ask you, what's your personal need? What is the thing that you're struggling with more than anything else this morning? What is it that you lay awake at night and you're thinking about? What is it that when you're riding in the car, man, your mind is just consumed with this thing? What is it that when you're at home or you finally get a few minutes to rest, it's just so consuming your thoughts you can't think about anything else? And it could be a myriad of things. So what's yours? Doesn't matter what everybody else is. What's your thing? Because God knows your name. And he can heal your individual need. And when you go through Scripture, you see that he took the time. Again, remember, Jairus came and he wanted Jesus to go heal his dying daughter immediately. 
And before he got there, he was doing other miracles. And that lady, her issue of blood, she got healed before that daughter. You say, my need's not as big, it's not as important. No, no, no. To you, it's huge. And with God, it's important. So I want to invite you today, whatever that need is, would you take a moment, and even right now before we leave, would you just pray and just say, God, I, I need your help. Here's my need, and I've tried everything else. I've been to counseling. I've been to the specialists. I've been to this. I've spent money on that. I have nothing left. God, I need you. I'm going to invite you this morning, would you come in faith like this woman did? Would you come in faith, believing that Jesus is the miracle worker? Believing that as we go through these stories, these aren't just stories from an old book that, that don't happen anymore. These are stories that we see happening on a regular basis. Jesus is doing miracles today just like he did then. Sometimes we write them off or we try to explain them away, but God is still in the miracle working business. And the greatest miracle that you'll ever experience is when he takes you from spiritual death to spiritual life. We call that when you, when you become saved. Saved from what? Saved from the flames of hell. Saved because you, because you become a child of God. You have your sin forgiven. And you are now clothed in the righteousness of Christ. When God looks at you, how do you know you have peace with God? Because he doesn't look at your sin. He sees the price that Jesus paid and the Bible tells us that that was the blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary. When he died and his blood was shed, that paid the penalty for your sin. And it says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, no forgiveness of sin. So we know how important that is. That it's the, We call it the finished work of Christ. Because there's nothing more you can do because he's already done everything that's necessary. So if you're in here today and you say, you know what, my, my greatest need is a spiritual need, then I invite you to start by coming to know Jesus as your Savior. And if that's you this morning, and I'm going to take time to do this because almost every week we have people turning cards that said, that's the first time I've prayed to invite Christ in my life. So if that's you this morning and you say, I didn't even realize my need or I knew, but I just haven't been ready. But today I'm, I'm ready. I've tried everything else. And if you want to know you're right with God, you want to have peace with God, I invite you, and if you'll just humor me for a moment, and all of us just bow our heads and close our eyes for just a minute, just for no other reason than just to keep the distractions down. And if that's you, you say, today, I want Jesus. Silently, just quietly there in your own, your own heart, would you pray something like this? Not magic words, but you have to mean them with all your heart. Just say, dear God, today I get it. Today, I understand that I've done wrong. The Bible calls that sin. And that a holy God cannot allow a sinful person into heaven. But you loved me so much that you sent Jesus. And because of his death, his burial, and his resurrection, through that suffering and that blood that was shed, I can have my sin forgiven. So the best way I know how, today, I'm inviting Jesus into my life. I want him to be my Savior. I want to have peace with you. I want to know that one day I'll be in heaven. And I want to live for him as my Lord. And I want to close this out in prayer. Father, thank you this morning. What a great story. It's an odd story to read it and hear that here we are having a conversation about a lady that had an issue of blood for 12 years, that it continued and didn't stop. And Lord, that's a strange story, but when we get deeper into it, we realize that it's not about her physical issue, it was about her faith. It was about her coming to you after she had tried everything else. And that you loved her so much, individually, personally, that while others knew her by her, her issue, you knew her by her name that you took time when others thought their needs were greater, a dying daughter, a desperate dad. But you said, no, this need is very important. And ultimately, God, you instructed her to testify in the street, 
to share her story. And if that doesn't challenge every one of us this morning, to go out of here and to share our story, to tell people of the great things that God has done for us, the healing, whether it's physical or the beginning of that spiritual healing. Lord, we've got a story to share. And my prayer is today that in this place, that those who are hearing this story will leave this place and that they'll go tell somebody of the great works that God has done. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.